everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks for streaming with us. The Teton County Coroner confirms the body found near Grand Teton National Park is indeed Gabby Petito, declaring her death now a homicide. Now on to the search, intensifying for Petito's boyfriend, Brian Laundrie, missing for a week now and is the only named person of interest in this case. After days of searching, police and the FBI found no sign of Laundrie in the 25,000 acre nature preserve, where his parents say they picked up his abandoned car last week. And now this case is renewing calls to help in other missing persons cases, like the search for Daniel Robinson, a 24 year old geologist who went missing in the desert outside Buckeye, Arizona in June. We'll have more on that case straight ahead. Former President George Bush announcing he will hold a fundraiser for Congresswoman Liz Cheney, heating up the battle for the future of the Republican Party. Cheney is one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump and her seat has been targeted by Trump loyalists ever since. And if you bought a mega millions lottery ticket at a pizza joint in Midtown Manhattan, well, be sure to check your pockets. A ticket sold at Pronto Pizza on West 48th Street is the sole winner of the $432 million jackpot. That's $350 million in cash. The second mega millions winner sold in New York this year. Who the heck has that winning ticket? Well, millions of Americans with the Pfizer vaccine are now waiting to hear from the FDA about booster shots. Authorization is expected for that third shot by the end of the day. After that, the CDC will decide who will be eligible for a booster shot of Pfizer. Meanwhile, President Biden holding a virtual world leaders summit on COVID-19. He is expected to announce the second U.S. purchase of a 500 million dose batch of the Pfizer vaccine to share with countries around the world. ABC senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami is at the CDC with the latest. It will be another way to fight this stubborn pandemic. Multiple sources tell us that before the end of the day, they expect that the FDA will say yes to a third shot of the Pfizer vaccine for millions of Americans. The decision then goes to the scientists at the CDC, where they'll decide whether to recommend the Pfizer booster shots to any or all of the following Americans, people over 65 or who have health conditions that put them at high risk, or frontline workers like nurses, doctors, police officers, and grocery store workers. In Ohio, more more help can't come fast enough. The governor says that his state is seeing the highest hospitalization numbers yet for people under 50 years old. The clear difference between these younger Ohioans and the older Ohioans is the rate of vaccination. And in Alabama, an ugly truth. For the first time in the state's history, there were more deaths in the year 2020 than there were births. We are seeing a decrease in the number of patients that are in the hospital, but unfortunately it's not because all of them are getting better and going home to their families and going back to their jobs, these patients are dying. Nationally, the number of Americans sick with COVID in the country's hospitals is starting to level off, but 10 states are still reporting a record number of hospitalizations, and six states are running out of beds in the ICU, with no more than 10% of them available. The federal government is trying to help the states this morning with people and equipment, sending 50 ambulances and 100 health care workers to North Carolina. Alaska and West Virginia are each asking for 50 ventilators, and the Department of Defense is sending 23 military medical workers to Tennessee. Here's a timeline on the Pfizer boosters. The FDA could make a decision by the end of the day. The CDC by the end of the week, which means that some Americans could get their third shot of the Pfizer vaccine as early as Friday. If your vaccine that you've already received is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, the government is saying that it could be another two weeks before a decision is made on those boosters. Kira? All right, Steve Osinsami, thank you so much. I'd like to bring in infectious diseases specialist at South Shore Health and ABC News contributor, Dr. Smo Wilds, for more on this. Dr. Wilds, thanks for being with us as we wait to hear more from the White House. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Well, it seems like the president is setting out some pretty big goals here. Even the administration says that they are deliberately ambitious, given the fact that the U.S. hasn't yet hit 70 percent vaccination rate when vaccines have been widely available for months. So what kind of difference do you think the president's plan will make in beating the virus both in the U.S. and for the globe? 
Kara, uh, first of all, I, I want to say I think it really is a great plan that President Biden is going to put forth later today. Um, we have a lot of resources here in the U.S., and I think it definitely is reasonable to share it with other countries that are in need. Uh, as we know, in other parts of the world, we, they don't have as much vaccines. And so really is something that I think we need to do is to share with all the other countries in the world. And again, remember, he's probably not going to only talk about vaccines, but sharing treatments, sharing testing, and also oxygen, which is really very vital. I think here in the U.S., of course, we want to get as many Americans vaccinated. And of course, once that happens, I think sharing it is a wonderful idea. Well, as you know, the United States has been criticized uh, by the World Health Organization for rolling out booster doses as the great majority of the world population uh, has yet to access even a single dose. But a senior administration official did say for every one shot we've administered in this country to date, we are now donating three shots to other countries, proving that you can take care of your own while helping others. That's the direct quote. As well as a physician, I want to ask you, do you think the U.S. is in a place where we can take care of our own while helping other countries as well? Absolutely. I, I think right now we have a lot of vaccines and there is more than enough available for all Americans. I think now that we have gotten all these resources, I think it's definitely time to share. We all want to travel. We want to engage with others, but we need to do it safely. And the most important thing we can do right now is to get many people across the world vaccinated. So NPR is now reporting that according to the COVID-19 scenario modeling hub, the pandemic may have peaked with new cases and deaths likely to decline through spring without a, quote, significant surge. Do you think that the worst is over here? Is herd immunity still a possibility? Kara, I am hoping that the worst is over. I mean, we have seen so many cases in the last few weeks I'm really looking forward to things peaking. And I think right now, even at our hospital, we don't have as many cases, but I am not going to stop to encourage everyone to get vaccinated because the fall is here and we're going to have to worry now, not only about COVID, but about the flu. So we still have a lot of work to do ahead of us. And the FDA could make a decision on that third uh, shot of the Pfizer vaccine for millions of Americans as soon as today. We reported that at the beginning of the show. And then the decision, of course, goes over to scientists at the CDC. We know what happens from there. So how could a third Pfizer dose impact our fight against COVID, you think? It will have a huge impact. Right now, you know, those over 65 and those that are in the high risk category, for instance, those that are working in the hospital, frontline workers, we are, they're exposed to COVID. And so we want to make sure that their immunity is as high as it can possibly be, especially now as we get into the flu season. So giving them an extra dose will make a huge impact on the numbers of cases we're seeing. Now, nationally, the number of Americans sick with COVID is starting to level off. That's good. But there's about 10 states, uh, doctor, that are still reporting a record number of hospitalizations, like in Ohio, Alabama. So how can it be that the future seems to be so optimistic while the current situation in many states is still pretty dire? Well, you know, Kara, a big thing is a lot of those states, people are not getting vaccinated. And because of that, with the Delta surge, we have a lot more cases. We have to work in those states to get more people vaccinated and help them to understand the impact that the Delta variant has at this time. So again, the states where we have a lot more people vaccinated, we see definitely lower cases and the opposite on those where there's a lower vaccination rate. So more work definitely needs to be done in those states with lower vaccination rates. We know you're working on it. Dr. Simone Wilds, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.
Now to the ongoing critical and chaotic situation at the U.S. southern border, where according to U.S. officials now, many of the roughly 6,700 Haitian migrants who are still camped out under that bridge in Del Rio, Texas, are actually being released into the United States, a reality that stands in stark contrast to the Biden administration's public statement that the thousands of migrants face immediate expulsion. ABC News' Kenneth Moten is in Texas with the latest on this large-scale operation. This morning, the Biden administration facing a political battle on both sides over the border crisis and mass deportations in Del Rio, Texas. We will get it under control. It's many Haitian remaining under that Del Rio bridge waiting to be processed. They have shown no capability of being able to process all of the, these migrants by the end of this week. Thousands of migrants have already been sent back to their home countries. On Capitol Hill, top Democrats normally allied with the president calling for a halt to the deportations. I urge President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas to immediately put a stop to these expulsions. A horrible treatment of these innocent people who have come to the border must stop immediately. And Republican senators grilling the Secretary of Homeland Security. How many people have been returned? How many people are being detained? How many people have been dispersed to all points around America? Uh, Senator, I would be pleased to provide you with that data. I want them now. Uh, Why don't you have that information now? Uh, Senator, I do not have that data. Why not? Army. Why don't you have that basic information? Senator, I want to be accurate. Some migrant families are being allowed to remain in the U.S. New video showing dozens arriving at this Houston facility Tuesday. In Del Rio, the activists with the Haitian Bridge Alliance are working to help migrants. People are coming to the U.S.-Mexico border because they are in need of protection, because they are dying, because they need support. And Kara, as the Biden administration works to ramp up those mass deportation flights, we can tell you that the number of migrants under that Del Rio International Bridge, just behind this fence here, that number is dropping. But there are still thousands of men, women and children, you mentioned it there, that are still waiting for help. The Biden administration is facing a political battle on both sides over this border crisis and the mass deportations in this community. But on Capitol Hill in D.C., top Democrats normally ally with the president are calling for a halt to the deportations. The Secretary of Homeland Security, he was grilled on Capitol Hill about the numbers of apprehensions and other things. Some migrants are being allowed to remain here in the U.S. They are being moved around Texas. In fact, we saw that in Houston at a facility, there were some Haitian migrants that, from this Del Rio bridge that were being held there. We expect to see more of that. But again, a lot of mass deportation flights are still happening, and the Biden administration is working to ramp those up, Kira. Our Kenneth Moten there in Del Rio. Kenneth, thanks so much. Coming up, Gabby Petito's homicide has ignited new interest in finding other missing persons. How other unsolved cases are now also receiving national attention. We'll have more on that straight ahead. And his daughter's haircut in school without the family's permission. Now a legal battle rages on over what her father calls a racially motivated act. And welcome back. You're watching ABC News Live. 22-year-old Gabby Petito's death has now ignited new interest in finding other missing persons. Her disappearance has actually mobilized people online, hunting for clues to focus on other unsolved cases now, including those of minorities that don't garner as much national attention. TJ Holmes has more. Her story has dominated news headlines and mobilized a legion of social media users. Hashtag find Gabby Petito gaining over 700 million views on TikTok. Um, I'm hoping this can help someone identify him. Many of them now internet sleuths, exchanging theories as well as sharing info about possible sightings and clues. Psychologically, people just felt very close to her because of social media. But here's the despairing truth. Gabby Petito is one of so many reported missing each year. At the end of 2020, the FBI had over 89,000 active missing persons cases. 45% of those cases, people of color. Petito's story has renewed debate about which cases get attention and the media's seeming infatuation with missing white women. But her case also sparked a call to action to bring others home like Daniel Robinson, a 24-year-old geologist who went missing in the desert outside Buckeye, Arizona in late June. 
His Jeep was found mangled July 19th, about four miles from where he was last seen. The Buckeye Police Department says in a statement, investigators are utilizing every resource possible to locate him, including assistance from partner agencies and information provided by the public. His family has also organized searches in the desert heat. I thank God for all the volunteers who left their houses every morning uh, in the mornings and, and spent out, um, time out there in the desert. There's also Maya Miliete and Jelani Day. Miliette, a mother of three, has been missing for over nine months. The 39-year-old was last seen at her family home in Chula Vista, California. Day, a 25-year-old graduate student at Illinois State University, was last seen August 24th in Bloomington, Illinois. His car was discovered two days later, but no signs of Day. Jelani is, um, he's a sweetheart. I shouldn't have to beg. I shouldn't have to plead. I shouldn't have to feel. That <laughs> there is a racial disparity. I shouldn't have to feel any about that. I want these people that have these resources to realize this could, this could happen to them. As you know, there are so many factors that go into a decision to put a story in the headlines, to include it in a newscast. And look, the Petito story uh, absolutely did go viral for a lot of reasons. And you have to admit, there was so much video, frankly, of her. She said it's such an online presence that that part of the story certainly was a part of it becoming viral. And, and people who are criticizing media coverage are not trying to take away from the newsworthiness of her story or to take anything away from the Petito family. They just want to argue as well, Kira, that there are so many others, uh, so many other families out there still waiting for word and also waiting for the same kind of attention possibly to their stories for their loved ones as well. Understood and important. TJ, thanks so much. Well, we are celebrating the histories and cultures of Hispanic Americans who have inspired generations. It's Hispanic Heritage Month, and who better than to celebrate the history and culture with us but our own Stephanie Ramos. Take a look. Hispanic Heritage Month is a time to celebrate our roots, our families, our culture, and our heritage. National Hispanic Heritage celebrations date back to 1968, but back then it was only a week-long celebration. It wasn't until 1988 when that week-long celebration was expanded to a month, and Hispanic Heritage Month was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. Oh, and if you're wondering why the celebration starts mid-month, well, that's because during those 30 days, at least seven Latin countries celebrate their independence. We celebrate the month recognizing the contributions and influence of Hispanic Americans in the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. We do that by holding festivals, art shows, parades, you name it, and you can't forget the food, arroz con habichuela, sancocho, flan, and the music as well, the salsa, merengue, bachata, bomba, and reggaeton. think that both words, Hispanic and Latino, can be used interchangeably, but they actually have different definitions. When we talk about Hispanics, it includes people who have roots in Spanish-speaking countries like Mexico, Colombia, Spain, Honduras, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and many more. Meanwhile, the word Latino alludes to people from countries in Latin America. For example, Brazil would get swapped out with Spain. Our nation is made up of different communities with amazing cultures. Ours is one of them. We account for the second fastest growing population in the U.S. after Asian Americans. Latinos are so invested in the United States. We're represented in corporate America, small businesses, health care, schools, and our armed forces, determined to make a difference and succeed while still staying loyal to our Latin roots. I'm a native New Yorker who is a proud Latina with strong Dominican and Puerto Rican roots. I am a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, and an officer in the United States Army Reserve. I couldn't be more proud to contribute to this country while all 
always remembering my culture. We get 30 days to nationally commemorate our heritage, but honestly, we are celebrating all year long. Así que a celebrar felicidades. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. All right, Steph, our, our, our true reina here at ABC, Stephanie Ramos. That does it for this hour. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks for joining us. Remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern with Terry Moran. Have a fabulous day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.